Well, good morning and welcome to River Church Online Worship. In just a few hours, we will have a crowd here worshiping together, but we continue to make this uh, worship video. For those of you that are isolating, you're staying at home, we respect that, we understand that. In these these weird times, if the Lord is leading you to continue to shelter at home, you do that. And because we love you and we wanna include you in the worship life of the church, we, uh, we, we, we put the work in to, make, uh, to produce these videos each and every week. So welcome to River Church Online Worship. We're glad that you've joined us, and I'm honored that you've invited me into your home. In just a few minutes, we're going to get started, uh, but I want to give you a moment to, to get ready. So remove any distractions and get something to write with and a pen, uh, or something to write on and a pen and your, your, your uh, Bible, uh, and uh, go fill up your coffee cup and, and just get ready. Uh, if you have any questions about River Church, you can go to our website, riverchurchrgv.com, and all things River Church can be found. If you want to get more connected, we have some gospel communities. That's like a Bible study or a, uh, uh, you might call it a small group. We call them gospel communities. We have some that meet online uh, virtually. So if you're sheltering at home, you still have the opportunity to get connected with other people at River Church. So go to our website, and it's real simple. You can, you can figure it out uh, how to get connected right there on the website, and then we'll get you into a group. Okay, well, we'll get rolling in here in just a second. We continue today with our teaching series titled The Great Exchange, a walk through the stories of the Bible. Uh, the Great Exchange is the phrase that I use to describe how God interacts with humankind. He makes this great exchange happen through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So every week I try to give you a a great exchange that I've made. And so I'm gonna tell you another one. And that is uh, I once traded a fishing trip down here in South Texas for a future pheasant hunt in North Dakota. Now I think I'm gonna be the winner in that deal, in that great exchange. The problem is I haven't found any time and it takes a little money just to get to North Dakota. So I haven't, I haven't received what I uh, get in exchange for a fishing trip. My buddy came down and he fished a couple of days with me. Now I need to go hunt with him. Uh, A great exchange I made one time, at least I hope it turns out to be a great exchange. But this great exchange that we're talking about in the Bible is not just found uh, in the story of Jesus, uh, traditionally speaking, in the the gospels, uh, in the in the story of the life of Jesus. It's it's found throughout the Bible. Uh, one thing that, that, that the, the guys that are, study, that are doing the, the bio, early morning Bible study with me on Wednesday mornings, one of the things that we're really enjoying uh, discovering is this story of Jesus woven throughout the book of Genesis, throughout the book of Exodus, and throughout the entire Bible. And so that's what we're talking about. Just so we're clear on what the gospel story is, uh, let's find it in 2 Corinthians 5. It says, for our sake, He, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So so God made Jesus who knew no sin, he was sinless, made him um, sin, our sin, he placed our sin on him so that he might then place Jesus' righteousness on us. I know, I know, it's, it's a crazy story. It's hard to believe except that the Holy Spirit gives us faith to believe that that's what happened on the cross. If you've been wondering what Christianity is about, it's that. Christ went to the cross, paid the penalty for our sin, and therefore his righteousness is credited to us. It's made our righteousness, and so we're no longer condemned. Week three of this study, what we're talking about today is um, what others mean for evil in your life, God means for good. The great exchange. He, took the, he takes the evil that other people, your perpetrators, um, impart on your life. And he takes that evil and exchanges it for good. Listen, if you've ever been abused, or this message is for you. God wants to take the evil meant for you by your wrongdoer. And he wants to make it for good. He wants to turn it for good. The heart of God is is for his people. The heart of God is for his children. He's been doing this throughout history. He's been taking what others mean for evil and and using it for good. The great exchange. That's how he looked down on his people way back in the story of of the Israelites 
uh, in Egypt, uh, getting ready to go out into the wilderness for 40 years, but they're still slaves. And Exodus 2 says that he looked down on the people of Israel and he knew it was time to act. He saw their pain, he saw their suffering, he heard their cries, and he decided it's time to act. It's time to take this evil and replace it with good. But I'm getting ahead of myself in going to uh, the story of the, the, uh, the Moses and, and the Israelites leaving Egypt. That's, that's still a few weeks uh, uh, from now, and then the plagues and, and all that, all that uh, crazy story. Uh, Pharaoh and, and, and uh, the, the, the parting of the Red Sea, all that. Today, how did all that get started? Today, how did they end up in Egypt in the first place? How did Abraham, begetting Isaac, begetting Jacob, who was renamed Israel, begetting 12 sons, how did all that lead to captivity in Egypt? Well, it all started with Joseph, a young, impetuous boy who really got under his brother's skin. Maybe you were that sibling in your family, the one who just got under everyone's skin. Well, that was Joseph. He was his father's favorite. His mother was his father's favorite wife. I know that sounds ugly, but that's the reality of these broken people's lives. Uh, so Joseph's mother was was his dad's favorite wife, and, there, and then he was his dad's favorite son. And his, his brothers hated him for it. And Joseph had this dream that seemed to imply that even God was playing favorites. <laughs> Genesis 37 says this, Jacob, that's the dad, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. One night, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him even more. Listen to this. Listen to this dream. Joseph said, we were out in the field, tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. <laughs> he has another dream later on, and basically what he says is, I had this dream, and, and my, 12, my, my 11 brothers uh, and, and my mother and father, everyone was bowing to me. And I was standing up tall, and they were, they were bowing low, young, impetuous, and his brothers hated him. So they, they sold him one day. I know, again, that sounds terrible, but his brothers sold him. They bound him up, they tied him up, they sold him to a band of wandering gypsies, and he went into this human trafficking industry, and he was captive in that system for about 13 years. So from roughly the age of 17 to the age of 30, he was a slave. He was being trafficked in this, in this industry of human trafficking. And, and then God showed up and showed him favor, immense favor. We're going to look at that story today. But still, 13 years of being trafficked, of being a slave and a prisoner? Where is God in the midst of that? That's what we're talking about today. Moving ahead in the story of Joseph and his life story, because we just don't have time today to hit every, every uh, detail. Uh, moving ahead, uh, this is how God favors him. God gives Joseph the supernatural ability to interpret dreams. And Pharaoh in Egypt, the, the king of Egypt, uh, he has this, this gut-wrenching dream, this dream that just will not, it's just eating him up and he needs the answer, he needs the interpretation. Joseph is brought onto the scene, out of the dungeon actually, cleaned up, brought to Pharaoh, and he's able to, uh, to interpret the dream. And, and as a result, uh, God esteems him. And you'll see how that happens. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. 
Now, mind you, he had just been dragged out of the dungeons, cleaned up, brought to Pharaoh, interpreted the dream. I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. Then he had Joseph ride in the chariot reserved for his second in command. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, kneel down. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. And then... On top of all of that, God brings Joseph's uh, abusers back into the picture. His brothers brings them back into the picture. Uh, his, his brothers showed up on the scene in Egypt, unaware of Joseph's newfound fame and his immense um, power. Here's what happened. They were starving in their homeland with their father, Jacob, who had been renamed Israel. They were starving and they were so close to dying that their father had sent them with money to Egypt to buy food from the Egyptian government. And they are suddenly face to face with Joseph, who they do not recognize. And they are suddenly at his mercy and of course, once they realize who he is, they fear for their lives. And once they realize, this is Joseph, and once they realize we're toast, how does Joseph respond to their fear? We see that in Genesis 45. He says to them, I am Joseph. I am Joseph, he said to your brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers, they were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please come closer, he said to them. So they, they came closer. And he said it again. I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. Remember, there was a worldwide famine going on. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last for five more years, and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. So, one big, happy family was reunited. And all is well until, until the 12 sons' father, Jacob, eventually died. And then they were all convinced once again, we're toast, Joseph will now kill us all. Let's read Genesis chapter 50, beginning with verse 15. It says, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of your servants, of the God of your father. Joseph, he wept when they spoke to him. His, brother, his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, 
For am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive, as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and for your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. To his brothers who had done him wrong. He spoke kindly to them. So here's what happens. By way of review, Joseph's brothers, they hate him and they sell him into slavery when he's about 17 years old. He spends 13 years in a dungeon. His ticket out of the dungeon is his ability to interpret dreams. Uh, all of the circumstances come together perfectly. He interprets a dream for uh, Pharaoh, the, the king of Egypt, and Pharaoh esteems him to the second most powerful ruler in all of Egypt. The, uh, the brothers, this is many years later, the brothers, not knowing whatever became of Joseph, they come to Egypt uh, because there's a worldwide famine and they need to buy food, else they will die in their homeland. Their father sends them with money and they are uh, surprised uh, by uh, the, the fact that they find, they find themselves in the king's court, but, but in the presence of uh, Joseph, their brother, who's now been esteemed, and he's the second most powerful person in the world, or in the, or in the, the kingdom of Egypt. And so they all come together, they move to Egypt, Joseph treats them kindly, gives them land uh, to live on as shepherds, uh, and everything's fine until... Jacob, the dad, also known as Israel, dies. And basically, uh, when their father dies, they send Joseph a message that, that, that says, hey, dad said to be nice to us. And Joseph weeps. And why does he weep? I suppose he weeps because even though he had treated them kindly, his, his evildoers... Even though he had shown them compassion and forgiveness, they still didn't trust him. Imagine that. They committed all these atrocities against Joseph. He forgave them, and yet still, his abusers, they don't trust him. It just shows that in these mixed up, difficult relationships that many of us live in, it just takes time. It takes time for it all to be healed and for it all come back, to come back together. And, and so one last time, uh, Joseph expresses his sentiment regarding uh, the torture, the imprisonment, the shame, the isolation, the isolation that he'd endured, his lost childhood, his lost innocence, all of that just rolling around in his head. And he says to his brothers, Brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. You did it on purpose. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That's the great exchange. That is the picture of Jesus in this passage. Others' evil motives are exchanged for the good intentions of the Lord. Oh, how I want you to see that as being available, operative in your life. You know, most objections regarding God that I see in people's lives are not, objections, are not objections to the supernatural. In other words, most people that I, that I talk to that don't believe in God or they have a real beef with God, it, their struggle isn't in believing that God is supernatural and, 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 and he's the creator of the universe and he's 
all-powerful. No, most objections, as I see them, are on a very personal level. How could God have done that? How, how, could, how could God have allowed that to happen to me? How can a good God allow such evil to take place? Well, the, the story of Joseph that we've looked at today, and really all throughout the book of Genesis, it, it shows us in several ways how, when life is at its worst, God may be doing his most special work, his, his best work in you. Right in the middle of the trauma and the drama and the difficulty. It may be at that moment in time that God is actually doing his best work. And you can't see it yet. It's still veiled to you. But soon and very soon, the veil will be lifted and you will see it. I'm convinced that if you give up on God too soon, you might just make the, 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 most, the biggest mistake in your life and you might miss out on, on the, 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 the most special grace that God's about to pour into your life in the form of rescue, in the form of renewal, in the form of taking what others meant for evil and turning it into good. So, so the key in overcoming, those, those of us that they're, they're living there right now. You've been abused. You've, you've been taken advantage of. You, you've been mistreated. Someone else has done you wrong. Your perpetrator has committed evil in your life. And that's, every one of us have experienced, has experienced something like that. Well, the key to overcoming the shame, the bitterness, the unforgiveness the real hatred that you probably have for your evil doer. How, how, how do we overcome that? How, do, how can we say like, okay, my, my, my heart has changed. Like Joseph's heart was changed. My, my, my heart is, the, the great exchange you see can, can happen. Yes, it can happen in your circumstances, a real turn for the better where everything works out in your life. But, but that, that great exchange, it can also happen in the privacy of your own heart. Perhaps that's the most important place where that can happen, where, where God can take out the evil, the results of the evil, the bitterness, the anger, the, the shame, the hatred. Take that out and in place of it, the great exchange, he puts healing, wholeness, love. You have no control over your wrong, the, the person who has done you wrong. But oh, that God might work in your own heart with the great exchange. Uh, God takes your bitterness and gives you a whole new heart. This is so key because I have seen so many of you. You've come to me and you've asked, what does it really look like? For me to forgive my, my father, my mother, a family member, my ex-wife, my friend who turned on me. What, what does it look like? They did me wrong. And you might even say, and then they, they have no intention of making it better. But I at least want to be healed in my own heart. What, Randy, what does forgiveness really look like? Many of you have asked me that question over the years. I've struggled with that question over the years. I think there are at least three key thoughts from, from, from the story of Joseph that we can, we can pull out and, and say, okay, that's what a whole new heart looks like. When God does the great exchange in my life, that's what it's going to look like. Number one, you don't take on the role of judge. You let God do that. We see that in Joseph's life. He says this. He says, am I in the place of God? In other words, like, brothers, is, is it my responsibility to, to mete out justice in your life, to, 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 to make sure that you pay? And, of course, the, the implied answer is, no, that's not my job, because, Joseph says, I'm not God. 
This first thought is so key. Don't, don't take on the role of judge. You let God do that. Putting myself in the place of God, it's at the root of most of my problems. When we think, I can, I can be God, I can take on the role of God, I can be the judge and the jury, I can convict this person all on my own, you're taking on the role of God. Do not try to be God. It never goes well. It didn't go well with Adam and Eve. I mean, that was really the allure uh, of sin in the Garden of Eden. Thinking, I know what's best. Thinking, I know better than God what's best for my life. That, that's what the... That's what the Satan attempted them with. You, you can be like God. If you eat from that tree, if you disobey the one rule, imagine that, just one rule. Don't eat from that tree. Satan said, if, 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 if you eat from that tree, you're not going to die. Instead, you're going to be like God, knowing both good and evil. That was the allure. That has always been the allure of sin, really, is I want to be like God. And one way that we try to be like God is I'm going to judge you. I'm going to convict you. I'm going to make you pay. But, but in, in Joseph's life, he says, look, am I God? No, I'm, I'm not God. I'm not your judge. If you know better than God, then you are, practically speaking, placing yourself in the role of God. Moral authority is either my responsibility or it's God's responsibility. And when I say, I'm going to take this on, I'm going to judge, I'm going to decide what's right and wrong, <clears throat> I'm going to make you pay, what I'm really saying is, I'm God. God's not God, I'm God. I know better than God. It's what Satan invites us to do all the time. You take on the role of God. But, but Joseph said, no, I'm, I'm not God. You know, when we worry excessively, in a sense, we're taking on God as or we're making ourselves. I'm making myself God. I, I know exactly what I need. I know exactly what God needs to do. But I don't think God's going to get it right, so I'm going, to, I'm going to worry about it. Joseph, he took himself out of the equation, and he trusted God is God. And therefore, God's going to do what's right. And I'm going to trust that God is going to do right. And my God, he says, no, I'm not. I'm not going to be the judge. That's that's God's job. When you seek retaliation on your enemies, on your wrongdoers, um, what happens? Long-term resentment, anger. You're trying to climb up there and sit in the throne of God. I'm going to be God. I'm going to sit here. And, and it, just, it just burns at your soul. It's my Romans 12. It says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. What's God saying? He's saying, get out of my chair. That's my role. That's my role. That's my throne. I'm, I sit in the judgment chair. You don't sit there. Get out of my chair. Yeah, what healing and wholeness looks like, number one, is you don't take on the role of judge. You let God do that. And number two... If I'm going to be healed, if the great exchange is going to happen in my heart, bitterness replaced with joy, then number two, I'm going to take a mountaintop view of life and not a valley floor view of life. I don't know how much hiking you've done. I don't know how, uh, if you've ever, you know, trekked through the monte or you've gone down to the river bottom and 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 uh, and hike through the hike through the, the the brush. If you've ever gone to the mountains and gone down into the 
the, the valley floor and hiked through the pine trees. But here's, here's, the fa- here's a fact. If you are lost while hiking, what you should do is you should get up high. You should leave the valley floor and you should get up high on the top of the mountain. Then you can look down and you can see where you ought to be. You can determine the right direction from the wrong direction. The fact is, from the mountaintop, you get a, you get a better perspective. And see, the mountaintop, that is actually God's view of our lives, of our situation. But God's view of my situation and my view, not the same. Not the same. Now, if you have a view from the top, like like Joseph did, then what you say when you see uh, evil happening, even in your own life, what you say is, God means this for good. God will turn this for good. God will work this out for good. And that's what jo- Joseph had a, had a mountaintop view of the situation of his life. Now, from the valley floor, you just see the here and the now. You just see the circumstances. You don't see God's perspective. You see man's perspective. And, and man's perspective is usually either that of the pessimist or that of the optimist the optimist or the pessimist so so here's how it goes when things are going well in your life you're really optimistic like things are going well for me and then when things take a turn for the worse when things aren't going well for you then what is your perspective on life you're a you're a pessimist things aren't going well things are going well for me i guess life is good and god is good things aren't going well for me i guess god isn't really good and i guess Life isn't really good. You see, from the, from, the, from the valley floor, that's all you get is man's perspective. It, and, and honestly, neither the, the, the optimist or the pessimist, neither of them is really taking on God's view. When circumstances are good, then God's good. When, when circumstances are bad, then, then God's bad. That's the valley floor view. You ever heard of a character in the Old Testament by the name of Job? Well, well, the whole book of Job goes against this optimist, pessimist view of life. You see, from, 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 the, from the mountaintop uh, view, uh, you're, you're neither a, a, an optimist nor a pessimist. From the mountaintop view, you are hopeful. You say, God is good all the time. God will come through. God is working this out for my good. From the mountaintop view, God's perspective on it, you become a hopeful person. You place your hope in the goodness of God. Joseph's perspective was this. Life is filled with evil, but God. God works it out. God works it out for good for those who are called according to his purpose. God will come through. Now, we don't ultimately take our cue from Joseph. We ultimately take our cue from Jesus. We want to be like Jesus, and and he modeled this like none other. Jesus, the one who said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He also, with with tender submission and trust, said, God, may your will be done in my life. When the soldiers were mocking him, when the crowds were spitting on him, when when he was nailed to a cross and died a shameful, wrongful death, what he knew was what the world means for evil God means for good. Nowhere else is that truth borne out like it is borne out on the cross in the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. 
What others mean for evil, God means for good. I think we kind of understand that. It's hard to embrace at times. I think we understand that. But let me talk to you briefly about another character. Is it's he's the he's the father of Joseph. We've talked some about him. His name is Jacob. Turned to Israel. This is his new name. The father of the of of, of, of the twelve. Uh, the 12 brothers that were ultimately the 12 tribes of Israel. I mean, Jacob, Israel, he's an important guy. But do you remember his story? Early on in life, his, uh, his mother favored him. His father favored his other brother. It's interesting how Jacob ultimately favored Joseph over his brothers. But, but Jacob, he's a boy, his father favors um, Esau, but his mother favors Jacob. And so Jacob becomes a conniving fellow. I guess he had daddy issues. Yeah. Conniving, a trickster. He tricks his brother into selling him his birthright for a pot of stew. He tricks his dad, lies to his dad, tricks his dad into giving him his blessing. Uh, he goes to a foreign land and, and deals with his future father-in-law. And there's some, there's some trickster stuff going on there. Uh, he, he has several wives and and one of his wives, he, he, he prefers to the other wife. So he shows real favoritism, which is just an ugly story. He had 12 sons, uh, and, and he favored one, Joseph. We already talked about that over the others. He, kind of a conniving sort of a life. And yet, and yet, in some way, his heart was aligned with God's heart in the midst of this brokenness. And, and God esteems him. God favors him. God names the nation of Israel after him. And so I wonder, I wonder if it could be said that that what Jacob, in his own doing, meant for evil, God meant for good. If I can make this even more personal, and man, this is a mind blower, but is it possible that I could say in my own life, as a child of God, it's not not a pagan who doesn't follow Christ, but as a child of God, could I, could I say that even what I mean at times for evil in my own life, God turns for good. God means for good. Said another way, I really can't screw up my life. If I'm a child of God, he is working all things together for my good. Is it, is it possible that, that I could say even in my own brokenness, what I mean for evil at times, God means for good. Is it possible that I could say, I don't need to fear screwing up my life. God has got this in the palm of his hand. Last thought from today's passage is this, and by, by, by way of review, the first one was, you don't take on the role of judge. You let God do that. Don't, 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 don't judge your uh, wrongdoers. That's the role of the Lord. And, and the second thought was this. Uh, take a mountaintop view, not a valley floor view of your life. And here's the last idea from, this, from today's passage, passage, and that is respond to hate with love. Respond to hate with love. What does Joseph do in the lives of his brothers and all of their the extended family, big family it was, he reimagines God's love in their life. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't show them uh, any sort of, of uh, residual hatred, resentment. No, it, it, he, he decides to, to provide for them, to say, listen, all of your needs for the rest of your life will be provided. I, God has esteemed me. I'm the second uh, most important ruler in, the, in, the, in all of Egypt. And, and what God has given me, I will now give you. I will it's all going to be okay, family. You don't need to fear. This, this takes enormous humility, but it also takes enormous confidence. To, to be able to, to, to show love back when, when all you've received is hatred, 
to respond to evil with, with good, with love. It takes, an, it takes a, a great amount of humility, but it also takes a great amount of confidence, God confidence. To image God's love towards your perpetrator is to love your enemies. One of the greatest ethics of the Bible, to love your enemies. Now, as we talk about loving your enemies, I want to be real careful here because I began the service by saying that I really believe that this is a message for those who have been abused, for those who have uh, been done wrong. And, and frankly, life is a long, long time, and, and most of us, if not many of us, if not all of us, have been done wrong at some point. And, and so this idea of loving your enemies, we're called to it. Jesus, he, he led by example. But, but I just want to tell you what, what that doesn't mean. Because I, I think some of us, it, well-meaning, we, we carry burdens that, that God does not intend us to carry. What loving your enemy does not mean? Well, number one, it does not mean that you take on the role of fixer that you're responsible to fix the person that has done you wrong, that you are responsible to fix your, your perpetrator, your abuser. Listen, only God can do that. that was, what they did to you is not your fault, and it's not your responsibility to fix them. So, so don't take on the role of fixer. Number two, what, what it doesn't mean to love your enemies. Number two, don't try to make up for the lost years. This may not apply to everybody, but, but, but for some of us, uh, because of the brokenness, because of the abuse, because of the wrongdoing, maybe you've lost 5, 10, 15, 20, maybe even more years than that in this relationship. And now maybe God is working, he's taking the evil and turning it for good. And, 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 and in a well-meaning fashion, maybe you want to make up for all those years. You want to see it all turned around. And I would just, I would just caution you more, more than anything. I would just encourage you that that's not your responsibility. It wasn't your fault in the first place, and it is not your responsibility to make up for the lost years. Trust. Trust that the Lord will reward in his own time, in his own time frame. But it's not your responsibility. And then the, the, the last, the last uh, item that I would, I would the, the, the third thing, that, this is not what I, what I mean when I say, or not what Jesus means when he calls us to love our enemies, and that would be uh, the attempt to regain a trusting relationship and to make it happen quick, make it happen fast. So that's going to take time. Uh, it may never, depending on the, the spiritual state of the person that has done you wrong, uh, regaining trust between the two parties, it may not even be helpful. It may not even be safe. Uh, in some cases, like between Joseph and his 12 brothers, his 11 brothers, trust was built. But you see, it, it, it took a long time. Joseph himself could not rebuild the trust. He tried. He he threw some money at the, the situation, he, he provided for their needs, and even still, they come to him and they say, look, we'll be your slaves, just don't kill us. Obviously, there were still trust issues there. And, and, and what Joseph had to learn, and I, what I want us to, to, to embrace is, is, loving your enemy does not mean that you are gonna be able to regain a trusting relationship on your own time frame. The, the God will have to do that in his own time according to his own plan. Well, as we wrap up our time together, I, I would say that, 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 that a big takeaway from this, just in summary, is I don't, want to, I don't want to put myself in the place of God. I want God to be God, and I want to be his child, and I want to trust that he is, he is turning the evil in my life on its head, making it for my good. I, I, I want to trust that. I want to, I want to believe that. And that's a big takeaway from this. But, 
But the bigger point, the biggest point, the point of this entire series for this entire year is this. Jesus went to the cross and he experienced evil in my place. That is the great exchange. That is the greatest exchange. Jesus went to the cross and experienced evil in my place so that I, so that you might now experience the righteousness of Christ. And in Christ, there is no condemnation. The cross is the ultimate example of God making good out of evil. The great exchange, trust in the goodness of God in your life, my friends. Amen. Okay, well, that's a wrap. Uh, that's it for the day. Uh, listen, today was a, was a, a weighty subject, the subject of, of other people doing us wrong, and, and, and maybe it struck a chord in your heart. If you have questions, if you need some prayer, if you would like f to, to discuss this a little further, uh, then you can connect with the elders at River Church. Uh, just send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, and we, your elders, would love to help you in any way that we can to pray for you, uh, to connect with you. Uh, maybe you're isolated and you don't have a church family at all. Reach out, send us an email, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll reach out to you. And we'll, as I said, help you in any way that we can. Now's a good time to go online and give. Uh, everything that we do at River Church, uh, all the ministries of River Church, they're funded by your good gifts. Go to our website, riverchurchrgv.com, and, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a button that you can click to give. It's safe and intuitive and uh, it's simple and and it won't take you that long, and, and uh, it invites you to do that. Uh, that is how we continue to, to minister here at River Church is because of your good gifts. And I, I thank you in advance, and I thank you for all the ways that you've given in the past. Your generosity is what has allowed us to continue to thrive as a church during this weird COVID era. So thank you. Um, as I said, uh, any questions, all questions, anything you might want to know about River Church, you can find on our website. Listen, I love you folks. Uh, I miss seeing you in person, uh, but I do know that you're watching online and, and, and I, 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 I appreciate that. I look forward uh, to the day that will come soon when we can again see each other face to face. Uh, but for now, just know that I'm praying for you and you have a, have a, have a, have a good day.